Well, good afternoon officially now as of this minute. Uh, thank you everybody for attending. Um, I think we take the award for the tallest presenters at VMworld that you will see. <laughs> at least for the rest of the conference at any rate. Uh, my name is Ken Wernerberg. I manage the technical marketing group for storage and availability at VMware. Yeah. And I'm Andy Banta. Uh, I'm actually working on VVOL's development at Solidfire right now. Uh, I've been working with VMware pretty closely on that and actually I'm an eight-year veteran of VMware. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we'll be talking about some advanced topics within virtual volumes, some of the configurations, some of the use cases that you could use with VVOL's. Uh, I'm guessing you've all seen this ad nauseum, so let's uh, repeat after me. Just make, no. Uh, who's seen a virtual volumes presentation at VMworld already this time? Nice. A lot of interest on the topic, that's for sure. Uh, who is not? Who is just looking uh, for some information about virtual volumes? Uh, wow, that's, you know, you're actually yeah. outnumbered. That's, <laughs> that's unusual. Yeah, it How is. How many of you have seen their first presentation in this, this VMworld? Huh? Well, so you're actually okay. pretty familiar with it. That's an excellent topic. So yeah. when we get into some of the weeds later on, we can talk about some of the use cases. Hopefully you'll, you'll pick up some ideas on things that you could do with virtual volumes that you might not have been aware of in the past. So what are virtual volumes? For those of you who are not familiar with it, it's a, it's a, it's a new framework for delivering storage that uh, VMware has developed in conjunction with our partners about delivering per virtual machine and, in fact, per disk uh, level of granularity for storage. It's a framework by which we can assign policies to our individual VMs and have the storage become aware of the VM nature of the objects that it is storing and thereby adhere to the policies and be able to change policies dynamically on the fly to meet the changing needs of the virtual machines and the applications that are running from a storage perspective. It's an industry-wide uh, initiative. We've worked, in, like, as I mentioned, in conjunction with our partners. It's based on things like T10. We are not trying to deliver a, a new set of protocols like iSCSI, NFS. It works with all of that existing type of an infrastructure. It simply changes the storage arrays to the point where they are now aware of the VM nature and the VMs can be managed from a storage perspective in a different fashion that we'll talk about as we go. Uh, I don't have, oh, I do have a clicker, excellent. Clickers are awesome. So architecturally, what changes? What m makes VVOLs a different type of an implementation from the storage that you may have seen in the past? We still have the standard type of an environment that you'd be aware of. Uh, virtual machines residing on a vSphere cluster, we still have storage arrays, but how those VMs communicate with the storage does change. We have different architectural pieces that are, are, are part of this framework that allow this to take place. And we'll be talking about these in a little more details. Fundamentally, the array is now presented as a virtual data store rather than a regular data store. And this is a very important point that we'll dive into in a little more detail. But by rights of abstracting away the, the physical connection to the data store, we can now communicate in a different fashion. We have what's called a protocol endpoint to allow I.O. to be proxied and intelligently delivered to the array and for the array to uh, communicate back through a, a standardized channel. We have a VASA provider. For those of you who are familiar with VASA, version 2 of VASA allows us a bi-directional communication with the array so that we can not only query the capabilities of the array, but we can offload requests to the arrays themselves to do all of the storage type of things that arrays should be doing. Rather than handling them through vSphere, we can just send a command to the array and say, please do what we need, it to, what, what we need done, whether it's snapshotting, cloning, copying reEMs, creating new virtual volumes, and so forth. Speaking of the capabilities, we query the array to understand what it is able to do for us in the vSphere world. QoS, snapshotting, all those types of things can now be sent to vSphere to create, in essence, a menu whereby we can create policies to deliver uh, 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 data services to the virtual machines on a per VM basis. So we query the arrays, we retrieve all the sets of capabilities, create policies around those capabilities, gold, silver, bronze, mission critical, uh, however you want to label them, these can be uh, application-oriented policies that we are worrying about in this uh, environment rather than worrying about an individual RAID type or a type of compression or anything along these lines. Uh, we communicate with these data stores via the VASA provider to query and to offload commands. We communicate with them for I.O. through the protocol endpoint, and we create policies in vSphere 
to allow us this business-oriented, this SLA type of oriented policy management of our virtual machines. Yeah, this actually cuts down an awful lot of the direct interaction between your vSphere admin and your storage admin. If your storage admin can just set up the capabilities, your vSphere admin doesn't have to say, hey, this should go on this data store, this should go on this data store. You can actually have them work more independently. Right. And fundamentally, once we have created our policies, we've crafted the policy and attached it to a virtual machine, we go to uh, create the new VM, the VMs are now stored directly on the array in a new fashion. This is what the VVOL is in the virtual volumes aspect. Each VM can be broken down into a subset of components that are virtual volumes. And we call them that because they can actually be handled discreetly uh, and intelligently on their own. And we'll talk a little bit more about what these types of objects are and how we handle them on the array. But when we talk about a VVOL, really, at the end of the day, it's this primary object on the array that represents a set of objects that make up a virtual machine that can be managed via policy. So I actually came up with an analogy for people inside my company who had no clue about what VVOLs actually were on, uh, on how, to, how to come up with a metaphor for VVOLs. And basically, it was like an online ordering concept for, um, for an abstraction. So VVOLs are just stuff. It's, you know, if you go to Amazon, you want to buy a pink fuzzy vest or the USS Missouri or whatever, you can look it up and buy it, typically. Maybe not in Missouri. Uh, not with Prime, at any rate, no. <laughs> no, probably not two-day shipping on that. And so uh, we get into different types of VVOLs in the, at this point. So how many know how VMs are laid out on typical VMFS? You have a directory that has a .vmx file on, in it. It has some log files in it. It has, uh, you know, typically some additional snapshot configuration files on it. All that information is now going to end up in a config vvol. So anytime that you create a VM, there's going to be a four gig config vvol that's going to have the VMX information. It's going to have the log information. If you go look at it through your vSphere browser, you're going to be able to look at those files just like you do now. They'll be right there in the, the storage container associated with that VM. Um, the, the VMDKs become data VVOLs. So you'll have one or more uh, data VVOLs for each VM. And if you do snapshots or whatever, you'll end up with additional data VVOLs um, that, that actually are tagged as specific snapshot VVOLs. Um, if, you, uh, if you actually suspend the virtual machine, you'll end up with a, a memory sna uh, snapshot VVOL that will be associated with that VM. Anytime you power on a VM, just like now, it will create a swap file, and that swap file will be a separate VM. Um, VMware specifies that there are other types of VVOLs that can be made, but the, the spec doesn't actually call out any that are really available at this point. Yeah. There, there are a handful of things we do, CDRC, things like this, get stored into the other type of VVOL. And when we talk about these VVOLs, so this is, this is how a VM is constructed on disk. Right. We have these independent discrete entities that are called the virtual volumes that represent all these different aspects of a VM. But how they are actually stored is in what we, we've alluded to, the, the storage container. So now we have an array with a full set of capacity that we can use to store our virtual volumes. What we no longer need to do is carve this up into LUNs to hold all of these different objects. We can do away with LUNs completely in a VVOL based, well, uh, from a presentation perspective, uh, in a VVOL type of an array. So we need to store them somehow, though, and we store them in what we call a storage container. Right, and a storage container actually will show up as a data store to the vSphere admin. How many people have like eight or 10 or 20 data stores on their system right now simply because they needed to add that many more VMFSs. Well, part of the, reason, part of the concept of a, data, of a storage container is it separates the idea that a storage container has a set capacity uh, different than the, the idea that a LUN backing of VMFS has a set capacity. We'll get into this a little bit more, but the other idea is that the storage container is no longer the, where the SCSI session ends for that storage. Right. So continuing on with my analogy, uh, a storage container is just like your house or your bookshelf or wherever you put stuff. So in this case, we have a storage container that has a bunch of VMs in it. Uh, well, it looks like an IKEA house. Maybe that's because where I, that's where I got the picture. <laughs> but I want to highlight this is also a logical living room. <laughs> yes, this is a logical living room. There's the, the living room can grow as big as you need it. You, uh, 
it, you, unlike your real living room, if you keep buying stuff, you can just keep putting it into your living room, your storage container. Yeah, we, we, we can grow our living room to the size of the full house if we need to do so. Yes. But as you start adding more and more VMs into your storage containers, you might run out of space in what you have logically carved out of the array as your storage container. But this is not like a LUN, where we have to pre-provision a whole a fixed set of capacity. I just seamlessly went from living room to LUN. I'm uh, pretty proud yes. of myself there. Uh, so with LUNs, we carve up space in advance, and we hope that we're going to use that space appropriately. We hope that it's going to have the right sets of capabilities. It's going to have the right furniture and all the rest of these things. But with the storage container, it's purely a logical entity within the array. We were carving out a certain set of capacity, and as we start adding extra VMs into it, uh, we find that they're getting crowded, so we just simply take over a little bit more space from the array, grow it on the fly, change the size of this logical entity that's right. represented. A data and, and some vendors might actually have limits on the size of a storage container. Uh, SolidFire, the, the storage container is as much storage as you have available, you, so you can just keep growing it. So uh, since the storage container is not the, um, not the session endpoint anymore, uh, Ken touched briefly on the idea of a protocol endpoint, which is what's going to show up as an iSCSI target or an NFS mount point, or if you have legacy storage, a fiber channel port. Um, and all of the connections will go through that. So going back to my analogy, this is kind of like the, the truck that delivers the, the stuff that you get to you. So uh, a protocol endpoint can serve more than one storage container. It can carry multiple different VVOLs. Uh, it's, uh, it has no association with either the stuff it's carrying or the storage containers associated with it. So, the way that you actually associate a VVOL with a protocol endpoint is called a binding. So ESX will ask the storage array, hey, I want to get this VVOL, and the storage array is going to respond to ESX. That VVOL will be available at that protocol endpoint. So uh, a, protocol, or, um, a binding is kind of like the, the way that you assign the stuff to various different trucks. So in this case, each one of those box would, boxes would represent the stuff that is bound to those particular trucks to get delivered to you. All of this is managed through a VASA provider. So you have an out-of-band process to, to associate, uh, or, or to ask the storage to do things like create a VM, delete a VM, snapshot a VM, copy a VM from one place to another, change the capabilities of a VM. So that's going to be an awful lot like your Amazon order page, where you go out and you ask for a USB headset, and this is what you get. <laughs> so this was actually intended as a fairly quick review of, uh, of what VVOLs are. And Ken and I actually talked about this ahead of time. We're going to try to keep the, the entire session fairly short, so there's lots of time for questions. We realize this is pretty much the end of the conference, and people might have more questions than actually what we can spoon feed you. But uh, here's where we get into what we actually were planning on talking about, an overview of uh, what's going right. on. So I just want to recap what we just talked about there. We've got a logical storage container that contains independent discrete VVOL objects that are accessed via a protocol endpoint of any sort of protocol that, that you're using that is supported for that array. And it's bound to the, uh, the virtual machine is bound to the VVOLs in the um, uh, storage container through this bind operation. So out of band management through VASA, IO through the protocol endpoint, binding operations attach the two, if that's uh, fairly clear. So why did we do this? What, what was the reasoning behind coming up with virtual volumes as a, what was wrong with normal storage, right? What was, we've been doing that forever and it's good. It wasn't fundamentally, uh, storage has not been designed with virtualization in mind years and years ago when I was a skinny young man, uh, it was designed around delivering I.O. fundamentally to a workload. And then we've adapted over the years very, very well. But the problem is not in terms of delivering storage or capacity or capabilities. The problem is in terms of managing that storage. So when we have a vSphere cluster with perhaps thousands of VMs running on it, how do we manage delivering the data services to that VM? And this is the problem that we're trying to fix so that we have this granular approach to managing virtual machines and the data services that they're requiring. So we 
have d developed this really fundamentally, if you think about this, from that storage policy-based management approach that I was talking about at the beginning. Being able to assign a, pro a profile to an individual virtual machine to guarantee that it is going to re receive the services that it wants, whether we're talking about QoS, D2, compression, snapshotting, all the rest of these things, we can now manage it on a per VM basis. So this is why we needed to do this. But as part of going through this process, we get extra benefits from it. We get separation of management traffic from I.O. We get much better utilization of network bandwidth. And this is a case where I, I actually think that VMware, VMware oversells the management aspect of it. Of course, the, you want the management aspect to be something that's visible to both your vSphere admin and your storage admin. But one of the biggest advantages of vVols are the improvements in both capacity and network bandwidth you get out of it. Uh, yeah. When you go out and you create a LUN, for VMFS, you almost never fill that all the way up. Uh, lots of times, people won't even add extents to, LUN, to LUNs to increase the size of their VMFS, so they have to go out and they create more VMFSs to handle more VVOLs. Uh, VMFS actually has a contention limit on how many VMs you can actually have in it and running at the same time. If you get up somewhere in the 20 to 50 range, depending on what your workload is, you end up with so much contention on the VMFS that you end up with poor performance sometimes. There's no VMFS contention with VVOLs. Right. And the other big thing is that if you can actually go out and change the policy on your VMs and just tell the storage array this is a different policy, you get away from this concept of having to storage vMotion a VM from one place to another to change the capabilities. Right. In addition, you're telling every, the, the storage array through the VASA provider, hey, create this VM or copy this VM here or clone this VM or snapshot this VM, you, it's a huge savings on your storage network. Right. Yeah, very, very much so. I mean, that, that, that shifting of policies is a huge thing because technically, as you've mentioned, usually we have to st storage vMotion. You put pr pr something into pre-production into a lab environment and you find out it's being used by uh, end users six months down the road. And you go, oh, crap. Now, how do we get that, the performance and the resilience that it needs with vVol is you simply edit it and the array handles delivering its new policy, which happens to now be mission critical. And we get into this in a little bit more detail later in the talk, but uh, SDRS, Storage Dynamic Reconfiguration Service, actually probably is one of the things that, the idea is that you're actually trying to move a VM to where there's less storage contention, but in the process, you actually have to storage vMotion that VM, which is eating up more of your storage bandwidth during that operation to begin with. Exactly. Uh, oh, I oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, I, I, well, actually, uh, before you go, sure. we've actually gone through an awful lot of motivation. I did want to mention the one, one of the things that we want to do is explain some specific configuration examples of why VM VVOLS is actually going to be beneficial for you. Uh, it's, we'll get into that in more detail. Right. Yeah. The use cases are, are the bulk of the, the technical conversations here. So, better management works with your existing infrastructure. We're not introducing new protocols. It, it uses that existing set of standards. Data scalability, we've addressed this a little yes. bit rather than pre-provisioning LUNs and hoping that we fill it appropriately. Each VM only takes, since we don't have LUNs and, and, and standard data stores, you could have what used to be 250 data stores to satisfy different capabilities. You could reduce that to a single data store and just present one data store that represents all of your storage capabilities. You don't need to pre-provision LUNs anymore and then hope that you fill them appropriately. Each VM takes only the space that it requires as it starts filling up your array. So data store scalability becomes easier. Uh, and we've talked a little bit about the bandwidth as well since we're now uh, trying to offload as much as we can through VASA to the, to the array to handle our snapshots and, and copies and all the rest of these things. We don't need to use our VMware data kernel mover. We can just use VASA to offload everything onto the array and let it handle all of the activities where we need to. So how does it look? This is a fairly different environment that we're talking about when we're delivering this type of storage. From the vSphere administrator, it looks very much the same. How we discover and register vVol-based data stores changes very slightly behind the scenes, but when we're creating a new data store, you simply create a new data store, you select a type of vVol, and you're done. You now see a data store like every other data store. You can browse it. You can um, dive into the individual VMs and take a look at their configuration. We mentioned the, the, the config vVol type. 
that actually has a very small VMFS in it in order to preserve the administrator's view into their storage. They still see VMs and they can browse them and see the VMX files and VMDK files that are now pointing to the other vVols, but it looks exactly the same from the vSphere administrator's perspective. Data stores, VM files, all the rest of that stuff. The storage administrator will see whatever the storage administrator will see through their tools for managing the array. So they get to see all the actual details around the storage. They can see the individual vVols. They can see the uh, profiles that are associated with the individual vVols. They can see the storage containers, which are represented in the vSphere side as a virtual data store. So each administrator sees the important information that they need to do their jobs without having to change different interfaces and, and learn new ways of managing storage or vSphere. Right. And you might ask why data storage still exists in this case. Uh, there's still an awful lot of things in vSphere that still operate at a data store level. There's uh, various different um, add-on products. There's the vRealize uh, um, operations, that type of thing that actually look at a data store level. And a data store level also gives you the, op on the opportunity to come up with a logical separation of your VMs. You don't end up with one big flat space if you don't want one big flat space. Right. Right. So storage is uh, uh, standard view of, for the vSphere administrator is preserved through the vSphere web client. Nothing changes there. They can still browse through all the rest of those things. And as I was mentioning, the storage administrator sees the real details behind the scenes. Right. And so uh, VMware actually very carefully thought about how to do this and use multi-protocol support, um, use existing protocol support. They wanted to have VVOLs to be available to anybody who was out there. Uh, the reason for this are an awful lot of storage vendors actually bake their secret sauce into the, the storage protocol, baking secret sauce. Sorry, bad analogy there. But simmer. <laughs> yes, simmer the secret sauce into um, their storage protocol. Uh, that's certainly true for like scale out storage vendors like SolidFire. Uh, and nobody wants to go out and qualify a new storage protocol, come up with uh, doing the, all the qualification and figure out, out how to actually get vendors to do it. So VVOLS actually uses uh, iSCSI or NFS or Fiber Channel or FCLE. Um, and, and uses the VASA provider as an out of band control to make use of those protocols. Right. So fundamentally what we've been able to do with this architecture is separate uh, the IO, I mean LUNs traditionally have done a, a number of different things. They serve as the capacity, they serve as the capability set, RAID, SAS, whatever it happens to be, and they act as the um, uh, management point as well. So we get capacity, capabilities, and IO all through a LUN. Here we have the separated out. So now what we can do is send our I.O. channel, as I was mentioning, through the protocol endpoint, which if you view this as a, in essence, at like a proxy sort of location, we'll have a, a, a mount point of some fashion, a primary LUN ID, but then it will redirect the I.O. for an individual VVOL to a secondary ID that represents that particular data path. So we have only I.O. traveling through the protocol endpoint to access its final location, and we've talked about how the rest of it gets, like, management traffic goes through VASA. So separation of function really gives us this capability around preserving an I.O. path independently of the management. Right, path. and this allows the, uh, this actually, go back Sorry, a yeah. second, this actually allows the storage vendor to, to manage how much uh, throughput and, and capacity is used per protocol endpoint. The storage vendor, or the storage uh, vendor is going to be the one who actually says, we need this many protocol endpoints to accomplish this much capability for the, the user instead of saying we're going to create a VMFS and that's going to have the, the session endpoint and you only get as much capacity as a session is going to have. So I think this is already it. Okay, and so um, as, I, as I was mentioning earlier with the advantages, um, whenever you need to do a, a vMotion or uh, a storage vMotion, uh, a snapshot, a clone of a VM. Previously, you, uh, that, this always went through the ESX storage stack, and you ended up chewing up an awful lot of storage bandwidth to accomplish it. Uh, this also went for creating a VM. And when you laid out a VMDK on a, a VM, it, ESX would actually sit there and write 40 gig of zeros if you didn't eco zero thick, thick VM. Uh, no longer the case. ESX will ask VASA the VASA provider to create a 40 gig VMDK for your storage and 
uh, the storage should very quickly come back and say it's available and you haven't used any storage bandwidth at all to do that. Uh, this is the example without vVols where everything is going from VMFS through, the, through vSphere and back uh, to the storage rate showing up huge amounts of SAN bandwidth. Um, with vVols, things are sent through the VOS provider and this is, uh, this takes care of mach um, virtual machine provisioning, as I said, clones, snapshots, and storage vMotion. In fact, you get rid of storage vMotion entirely by simply changing the capabilities of your storage. That, that comes up quite a bit, uh, SDRS, uh, storage vMotion. You don't really need that anymore. If you have your entire storage represented as one big data store and all of the various capabilities that you have are accessible simply by shifting a policy, you don't need to move virtual machines around anywhere near as much as you used to in the past when you had to shift them between different Yeah, the last lines. time that you'll do storage vMotion is when you copy your last VMM, VM from VMFS to vVols. Next week, right? That's right. Next week, yeah. Uh, let's move on to the uh, official, you know, some of the advanced topics, some of the use cases that you might not be aware of. But fundamentally, we get all sorts of different benefits from vVols from a very technical change that we're doing has driven a lot of benefits around these various areas that we talk about in terms of reducing the, the tie of a virtual machine to a particular location on disk, in terms of allowing the VM to be put in charge of the requirements rather than the data source representing a certain set of capabilities, put the application in charge of requesting it. And also, a very important one is in terms of the soft costs. Traditionally, we'll have to, ha ha we've seen a lot of customers that have the situation where the vSphere administrator and the storage administrator um, should be best friends and they're not. Because you end up with this, uh, hey, I need a new uh, LUN that has some flash. We don't have a, a LUN that has flash. Well, can you carve up a new one? Uh, no, that's already in use by these other VMs. Uh, well, let's move some of those VMs onto a different data store then. Yeah, but those other ones aren't replicated. And it goes on and on. You have this continual cycle. Uh, and by the time maybe you've got lots of ones, the VSER administrator sits down on time to go deploy a new VM. Uh, I've got 180 LUNs or data yeah. stores. Um, where yeah. do I put this? You know? Yeah. Or, you know, you get into your uh, six digit IT ticket number. Yeah. <laughs> Which is an Excel spreadsheet. Yeah. <laughs> exactly, yes. So it d eliminates that because now everything is policy based. Everything right. is written around this concept of gold, silver, bronze, cardboard, brown, yellow, green service levels that we're attaching the VMs to, and the arrays understand how to deliver those capabilities without having to go through that iterative process of, of communication. Right. And so that's actually where we'll get into some examples. So it's not just your, uh, you know, gold, silver, copper uh, provisioning anymore. Um, you actually get to the point where you can set up the, the QoS and the capabilities of each vVol individually, and it doesn't even need to be categorized anymore. You know, if you have one vVol that needs a, a min IOPS of, you know, 1,000, and you have another vVol that needs a min IOPS of 1,004, there's absolutely nothing preventing you from configuring uh, your vVols to be done that way. So let's go to one of the first examples I want to talk about was um, the idea that you actually have a, a memory over provisioned uh, ESX server. In that case, you, uh, you end up with the possibility that VMs might end up swapping uh, if you're in a boot storm or you actually are, have a lot of heavily used VMs. In that case, you're actually going to have a swap vVol. One of the things that people probably don't think about until it's too late is that while a swap vVol probably is not going to use up a whole lot of I.O. bandwidth most of the time, when you actually are using the swap vVol, you really should give it a really high min I op rate and because if your, VV, if your VM is starved for memory and it can't actually do anything, nothing is going to happen on your system. So get the VMs running and then get them, allow them to do I.O. So in this case, you, you might have an entire policy for the VM, but set the, the policy for the swap vVol higher. Pointing this out, mostly just to point out that you can actually set individual capabilities on the different uh, types of vVols within a VM. These are going to be capabilities that you can go in and set up on your storage or array, uh, you know, whether it's minimum IOPS, max IOPS, burst IOPS, uh, you know, whether you want to deduplicate it or that type of thing. These are all capabilities 
that you can go in on vSphere and say, hey, this is what I want for this VM, and more specifically, this is what I want for this individual VMDK. And uh, the, once you set these uh, policies on vSphere, you should have managing capabilities on your array, and the array will, will provide those capabilities to you. So in this example, oh. Sorry, I, I was just going to mention, I, I think that was a very good uh, uh, situation there, right? Where, well, it's not a good situation. You start swapping. That's a terrible situation. But you don't want to necessarily sit there and have to go through, right click on every VM, go take a look at its disk files and say, uh, I'm going to change that policy. Okay, I'm going to do that. We have a, uh, an API for SPBM. You can actually script this, where you're alerted a certain threshold of swapping is starting to take place. We then dynamically alter the policy for the VMs swap VVOLs only to give them better performance to, to try to alleviate some of that issue that's going on around your, your performance handling. So it, it, it's actually an extremely dynamic way to adapt the workloads or adapt the services for the workloads as they need them based on what's currently happening at a given point in time. And so in this case, you would want to set a very high policy for at least the min IO ops for your swap. Um, and, and I'll point out that if your system is continually swapping, you might want to actually add more memory to it. It's, um, VVOLS is not going to be a solution for a system that swaps all the time. Yeah. <laughs> so another... the tweets now. <laughs> VVOLS makes swapping okay. No. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> definitely not the case. So actually one that's uh, a lot more relevant for SolidFire is the multi-tenant use of uh, VVOLs. So if you have an array that's actually used for a variety of different, or a storage system that's used for a variety of different purposes, uh, the storage containers actually give you a very nice logical way of separating uh, you know, one thing from another. You could have a finance department in one storage container, you could have DevOps in another storage container, and you can manage those, uh, those VMs very differently simply based on the storage container. Or in a service provider environment, like SolidFire is, is common, you could actually put different customers in different accounts. So you could have the Coke account, you could have the Pepsi account, you could have whatever account you want. And the nice thing in SolidFire's case is that if you have a customer who hasn't paid their bill, you can simply say this account doesn't work anymore and all of the VMs in that storage container are not going to be bound anymore. Uh, it's a hard line to... <laughs> VVOLs, enables, uh, cutting off services. To yeah, yes, there you are. <laughs> but this is, uh, I don't think an awful lot of people think about how storage containers are going to be used because they're just used to a storage, con a data store on vSphere being a LUN rather than a, yeah. just a logical concept. And that's, that, again, that's a huge piece of this. It's a logical concept. It's not tied to a particular shelf, a particular set of disks, anything along those lines. And in fact, you probably shouldn't tie it to a particular shelf, shelf or set of disks or anything along these lines. Because again, we're, we're representing all of these capabilities up to the vSphere uh, admin to consume via policy. You would probably want to have all of your capabilities represented in all of your different storage containers. Probably. You might not want to. It's entirely up to you how you want to carve up these uh, storage containers. But the premise is there. It's a, it's a dynamic way of, of presenting capabilities to different tenants, and you can logically grow, shrink, change how that logical container is configured at any given point in time. Right. And it has, um, the storage container doesn't necessarily tie you to any particular policy. So if you have two different tenants that actually need similar policies, they can certainly get the same policies they will potentially be going through the same protocol endpoint. Uh, there's, the storage container is simply logical and the connection on how that gets to the storage is uh, common. So another example is uh, there's some capabilities in, uh, in VVOLs to handle replication and not a whole lot. <laughs> um, but the, the idea is that there actually is a toggle for handling replication and that could be local replication, or if the storage vendor actually supports it, some remote replication as well. Uh, yeah, we, so to be clear around this one, if you go back and you spin up your solid fire array, you get VVOLs running, you get, you get all of this exposed to the vSphere environment, we see all of the capabilities, and you go, where's my replication? Uh, it's not going to show up in SPBM yet. So from a policy perspective, we can't, um, dynamically manipulate replication as a property to be added or, or, or removed from individual virtual VMs. Yet. 
but you can replicate a virtual volume. I mean, yes. the replication will work. Uh, you, the replication that's built into the array will be fi fine, and the virtual volumes can be copied somewhere else. We just can't do that dynamic replication policy aspect of it yet. But that is absolutely a piece that we're looking at. So. But the nice thing with replication as well is that, uh, you know, a VVOL is a very, very primitive level of, of object that we're dealing with. We have VMs that can sit on a VMFS, on an NFS. We don't particularly care. If we replicate a virtual machine through a software mover or something along those lines, you can replicate to and from a VVOL array to a, a standard VMFS, anything along these lines. It, it, it's completely, um, uh, VVOL replication is independent of the fact that it is a, a VM object that, because the VM doesn't understand its storage subsystem component layout. So we can replicate VMs back and forth without a problem. Just from a, a management perspective, we, we still have a bit of work to do. Okay. And snap snapshotting is another example, uh, both managed and unmanaged. Uh, yeah, so the, if, we're snap wheelhouse. <laughs> if we're snapshotting virtual machines, uh, traditionally we've had a, a redo log based snapshots that are handled through the snapshot manager in the vSphere web client, right? And that has some limitations in terms of performance, particularly if we have a bunch of snapshots or large snapshots when it comes time to commit or, or handle those. Who, who, who looks forward to that part of your daily administration? Not a lot of people, right? It takes a long time to roll all of those changes in and, and commit that snapshot. With virtual volumes, it's handled differently. And we have two means of accessing those snapshots. You can do a managed snapshot, which is still being uh, uh, handled through the vSphere web UI, but it still has the limits in terms of the maximum snapshot chain. Uh, or we can do unmanaged snapshots, where we can still go onto the array and snapshot individual vVols, if necessary, through um, uh, the different UI. That has advantages in terms of not being limited to the snapshot chain depth that we have within vSphere. So you can snapshot vVols very easily, but let's get away, what we're doing is getting away from this redo log based snapshot that sits off the side of a VM that we then have to handle in some fashion of committing. If you picture this more like a, a copy on write type of a mechanism, where all of the IO, even after a snapshot, still goes to the primary VMDK, or vVol, uh, data vVol, not the v VMDK, goes to the primary snapshot, and the snapshot itself becomes this copy on write area. So it's only after we start overwriting data that we take that data and put it into the snapshot. So the benefit there, commits happen like that. Deletes happen like that. Like we get rid of that um, caught by on write based snapshot almost immediately and it's all handled via VASA and offloaded onto the array. So. And it also allows storage vendors to implement exactly. their snapshots in the way that they see fit, yeah, uh, no, no implementation from VMware is involved there. Right, we were just doing a call via VASA saying please snapshot. How that snapshot gets implemented is up to the, the, the performance benefits of the, the implementation by our partners. Exactly. Did you want to get into managed versus unmanaged at all? Or? Uh, no, I've addressed that. Okay, okay, good enough. Okay. So one of the um, one of the main reasons that VMware, one of the things that VMware did when they came up with VVOLs was try to make sure that it actually supports all the stuff that exists today, um, just all of the capabilities that you currently have available to you today through VMFS or through an NFS data store. Uh, it's, there's very little that you can't do with VVOLs that you can with the VMFS. One thing that you might be surprised by, you see storage vMotion is supported on there, but storage DRS is not supported. Uh, we kind of alluded to this earlier. Why do you need storage DRS if your entire array capacity is represented through one data store? So the requirement to do a lot of storage DRS type of operations has really, really been minimized. Now that said, we are looking at making changes in VVOL structure as a whole. Uh, we can't really talk about some of those things there, but just keep in mind that the requirement for storage DRS isn't there right now. With a VVOL, that is a single data store, but as you can see, every, pretty much every feature that's in uh, vSphere is supported when using VVOLs, because most of these are operating at a level that the storage subsystem has nothing to do with. These are all happening up at the, the vSphere at the ESXi level rather than at that storage level. So the things like uh, 
fault tolerance, SMP fault tolerance is not supported because again we've got multiple disks that we have to handle at that level. But the things that come up quite regularly, backups, does our important piece of any uh <laughs> environment you'd think. Yes, it still works. We still have VADP, VDDK, those things operate at a different level of the environment than uh at that storage subsystem. So if you think about VVOLs, it's a very, very low level primitive type of an operation when we're doing snapshots and clones and things like that. All of the APIs are coming in at the vSphere level and then being passed down to the VVOL array. Okay, and I'll take a, a short VMware here. One of the reasons that you actually do need storage vMotion is if you want to move a VM from one storage container to another, there's absolutely no capability right now to actually say, hey, this belongs in the storage container. So you do end up needing the storage vMotion it. Yeah. That storage vMotion might be a very simple call through Vasa saying, hey, copy this, and the array might actually be able to figure out there's not actually anything to be copied here. So we've got uh, 20 minutes. I want to make sure that we get time for Q&A. Is there anything that's burning in your minds right now? Any questions that you really want to answer? Microphones right? on either side. There are microphones, but uh, we'll get you in a moment there. No, come up to the microphone, please. Managed versus unmanaged snapshots. Really, uh, uh, an unmanaged snapshot has a number of benefits in terms of depth, really. So if you are running with a lot of snapshots, use the unmanaged snapshots, because we are still limited in the, in the vSphere uh, snapshot manager. But the nice thing here as well, again, because there's such low impact on the snapshots, you can run snapshots every minute if you want to. Uh, really, to my mind, it's, it's not a question of using one versus the other, aside from what the use case is that makes sense to you. If you want to do things programmatically, you'd probably want to use an API to go in and call the snapshots in, on the array. Uh, so if you just need to run an individual snapshot to, for a rollback test or something like that, you'd probably use a managed snapshot. But uh, th there's no hard and fast rule about one being better than the other. It's, it's simply a, a use case question. Hi. Hello. Uh, one of the greatest things about VVOLs is the publish capabilities. What, what capabilities stand out to you now and in the future you think that really kind of make right. this special? So in terms of the capabilities, snapshot. Well, like encryption or something like that. You know? I'm sorry? Like encryption or, you know, other encryption things. Encryption or QoS, yeah. things along these yeah. lines. Um, we don't dictate what those capabilities are. This is up to our partners to be able to expose those things. Uh, the capabilities that are exciting to me personally, um, I, I have to be kind of cheesy and say lots of them, <laughs> but it is also enabling us, this capability representation has really cool, unique things around things like QoS, for example, where we can apply per VM QoS policies into uh, the, via, poli uh, via the SPPM engine and attach that to an individual virtual machine and maintain that visibility all the way down. So we have lots of different capabilities, encryption, compression, deduplication, QoS. Uh, there are many, but it's not up to us to determine those things. Right, and these are capabilities that a storage vendor would provide. So like uh, you could have a, a deduplication toggle, you could have an encryption toggle. Um, you might actually have multiple compression techniques that you want to use or, or best compression fit. Um, but uh, I, I think actually one of the coolest things is the QoS capability where you can end, end up with sliding capabilities for both like MinOp, MyOps, Max IOps, um, you know, if your storage system supports it, burst IOps, th those types of things. Um, it's th the ability to actually fine tune what the the capabilities are for each VPO uh, in terms of IOPS throughput, latency, that type of thing, is probably you know one of the biggest features from my mind right. in VVOLs. And that's actually a really exciting thing for me too with with virtual volumes with these capabilities. A lot of people when we start, start talking about virtualized data stores, uh, some people get the impression that we're talking about creating a homogenous layer of storage, and that's not the case. What this allows is for our our partners to be able to deliver the same capabilities and new capabilities in an even more direct fashion to individual workloads. So I think it, it really does 
enhance that uh, ability for our partners to deliver these types of services because now it can be done via policy on a per VM basis. So setting up QoS against an individual VM, setting up dedupe for the entire array, if you want yeah. to, uh, is really a matter of, of or as we policy mentioned, setting, rather than a matter setting of setting up QoS per individual VMDK rather than an right. entire VM. Yeah. So I think it's, I think it, they're all pretty cool, but it, it's the fact that we can now do these in a new way that, that is really interesting, separating it from LUN capabilities to VM capabilities. Yeah. I have a two quick question. Uh, one thing you mentioned that some of the VMs, like in a VWAL, I can replicate it, whatever I need to do the replication, I, I can do the dedupes on the same VWAL, right? I can deduplicate some VMs or I cannot, you know, I'm just trying to figure out, you, says, you mentioned that it's a VM level control, right? Per machine on the VWAL? Sorry, I, I didn't catch the question. So there. basically you mentioned that I can dedupes per VM base on the one VWAL volume. You can have a, a, a per VM decay or per data, different objects within the VM can have different policies. Is that what you're, you're right. asking about? Yes, yes. absolutely. Okay. Yeah. So if you imagine something like a database use case where you'll have a handful of different disk types or requirements of data services for different objects. You might have three VMDKs, one's a redo log, one's a primary data, whatever it happens to be. That's all one VM, but you could have different policies on each of those. I think you're asking about replication. Yeah, so, so it's basically okay. all four you are mentioning about like, you know, in the one volume level, like I'm, you know, familiar with the VMFS, so you, whatever you can do it on one VMFS level. Dedupes, so everybody's on the one VM, you know, one VMFS store, it will be deduplicated, right? While what you are saying is I can now do the same VM level. So let's say on this one VWAL, I have a three VM. One I want to deduplicate, right? Can I do that? At the same time, I want to encrypt the other VMs on that machine, but I doesn't want to do the other VMs, you know, encryption. So can I do that kind of separate policy per VM base on the same VWAL? Uh, so the VWALs are the objects that represent the individual VMs, right? Or, or represent, you'll have at least three VWALs per VM. Uh, the VVOL, the volume, is not a, a data store concept anymore. The volume is the objects of the VM. So one VM will have a config VVOL, it'll have a data VVOL, it'll have a handful of different things. And those are discrete objects for every VM. Right. And you can assign policies to each one of those if you want to. Right. It, it, this is actually reversing the concept where you don't have multiple VMs in a volume. You have multiple volumes associated with the VM. It completely turns the enti uh, entire abstraction upside down. So yes, you could have one encrypted, the other non-encrypted. You could have one VVOL with a um, deduplicated, the other non-deduplicated. Yes, each, each VVOL associated with the VM can have a completely separate policy. Okay, great. And how does this VVOL would work with the SRM where, you know, we want to replicate only some machine using SRM. It does SRM. not work in SRM, work yes. SRM. SRM. Next question. Right. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, SRM is coming. SRM support, we're, we're, we're yeah. working So when you were talking about creating this storage container on the array, you talked about you can set aside a size, easily grow it. Is contraction built into the A storage model? container is a completely logical concept. There is no size associated with it whatsoever. It's, it's an attribute of the virtual volume. And so it's up to the array to evacuate physical disk if that's necessary as part of contraction, and you don't care. As long as you're not going smaller than the consumed space, we're good. A storage container has no space whatsoever. A storage container is, you know, is your, the T-shirt, what it, what it wears. There's still objects on physical disk, and that's kind of what yeah, I'm yes, driving yes. to. So if you so have to if, maintain if, the array for some reason, and it's cleaner to this, this is actually going to be a vendor-specific uh, yeah. statement as well. So growing is simple. Shrinking, uh, you'll have to talk to your individual vendor about, about that. Right. And I'll warn people, who, those who stick around to the end get to shoot rockets at us. Yeah, you get to, you get to hit those presenters. It's great. So, so um, there's different implementations where the VASA provider lives and that where on the solid fire does the VASA provider live and how many... VVOL objects do you support currently in your implementation? So are you familiar with the um, SolidFire uh, architecture at all? No. Okay, so SolidFire actually is a cluster of multiple nodes, and uh, it's a completely scaled out architecture. You just simply add nodes, and as you add nodes, you'll increase your throughput, you'll increase your capacity. 
So the VASA provider is actually provided in the, the cluster, and uh, it, it's, it's just like you access the cluster now. There's, a, there's one virtual IP address that you talk to, to use, you use to talk to the cluster. It's the same virtual IP address that you will use to talk to the VASA provider. The VASA provider will move around from node to node. If you have one node that fails for some reason, one node that gets cut off from the network, the VASA provider will be on, on a node that's available to the storage. And I'm not talking anything about capacity at this point. All right, when y'all are going over, when y'all are going over uh, the different uh, VVOLs, policies, uh, I, I may have missed it. Y'all aren't changing any of the file names that are, we're used to seeing VMDK or any of that? VMX, or are you saying that's the case? If you're talking about through the, the data store browser, I'm pretty sure that this, it still shows up in the same directory structure where you will have a data store and you'll have VMs under that data store, and if you browse into a VM, you're going to see any VMDKs, any snapshots, okay. any swap, okay. any, anything like that. VMX like file still, you don't change the way like we can get in there and kind of play with that while it's live sometimes and mess things up. I'm sorry? <laughs> I, I get a VMX lot of echo file. off of that mic for some reason. Yeah. The VMX file, that's still... VMX file still, still read in the memory exactly the same, the same way. So that config vvol holds VMX, it holds okay. log, it holds log. So there should be no reason we couldn't storage vmotion from traditional into vvol live. Exactly. That's actually part of the reason for vvol is that they don't, that there was an effort to not make the vSphere's okay. administrator's life look any different. Now, if you go edit that VMX file and take a look at the contents and the pointers to the VMDKs, you won't see a path to a VMDK, you'll see okay. a path to a vVol. But okay. aside from that, it looks exactly like it did. Is anybody using uh, NetApp, NFS, and vVols? Anyone using NetApp and NFS, vVols? Okay, I see a couple right. of them down there. Yeah. Try to remember, I'm gonna bug y'all later. <laughs> I think you should sync up with one or two of these guys. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I have a question regarding the snapshots. When you take a snapshots, uh, whether it will take a snapshots of a config vvol also, or it will take a snapshots of only the data vvols? Um, you solid fire all the letters. Yeah, so, so the, the reason I'm asking is uh, from the data protection perspective, uh, when some backup went, wants to take a backup of the whole, all the virtual machines, they want to take a point in type backup basically. So the, the snapshot, um, so a managed snapshot, is going to be exactly the way it is today when you go in and you say, I want to snapshot this VM. That's going to send VOS requests down to SolidFire, and we're going to get a snapshot request for the config, a snapshot request for the VMDK, and a snapshot request for swap if it's actually running, so a, a snap re snapshot request for all of, all, the VVOLs. all of the VVOLs associated with it. If you do unmanaged snapshots, which is going in through the array and say, I want to take a snapshot, you would be snapshotting only one vvol at a time. Now, certain storage vendors might actually have the capability to say, hey, all of these vvols belong to one VM, and Take you can snapshot set. them as a set, but that's, that's going to be entirely storage, for in, storage vendor independent. So is there any mechanism where you can convert managed snapshot to unmanaged snapshot or unmanaged no. snapshot to unmanaged? Not that I know of. I don't think that there's any way that you can actually take an unmanaged snapshot and expose it to VMware as the managed snapshot. You can, you can expose it as a vvol. You can tell ESX that it's there, but it's going to have no way of actually associating it with the VM. Um, and it, actually, there is an API that's provided that lets the vendor's UI software or storage management software this is take an unmanaged snapshot and convert it into um, uh, a VMDK that you can hot add to a VM or something like okay. that. Yeah. It this doesn't show up as know. a snapshot of the VM, yeah. but it shows up as a disk that you can add and have a look at. Okay. And on the snapshots, uh, I don't believe we bother taking a snapshot of the config vvol because the whole state of the snapshot, the machine state, the descriptor files for the snapshots, everything goes into that config vvol. So there's no need to snapshot the config vvol, and we don't snapshot swap and things like that. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. Five minutes left. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, you guys made a mention of VASA 2 earlier. Is there a capability that VASA is going to deliver that we don't have maybe today that's, that's coming? Because it sounds like there's this two-way communication, but today VASA is kind of one way, right? Right. So, and I know that the, the provider is sort of a vendor implementation, but um, 
I guess what I'm asking is, are we waiting? Are we in a waiting state for some sort of new VASA release to? So VASA a lot two of that? is already out. I mean, that's part of the platform today, and this is the bidirectional one that allows us to set as well as query. Um, and yes, it's an evolving spec. We are, it's not fixed in stone. We're, I mean, it's it's fundamental for our next iterations of VVOLs that we're going to need another version of VASA and sure. so forth. It is absolutely a 100% evolving spec where we're going to be adding functionality and things like that into it. But we're not waiting for anything in particular today, I wouldn't say, but okay. unless you're looking for a specific function, but then we should talk. No, no, no. I just meant um, I wanted to make sure at least that it was, I guess, out there for vendors to implement and that it was already implemented and wasn't sort of like a maybe in, in three months when a big no, update no, no. goes out. No, no, has been around for years. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, I understand that. I was just, this particular component of VASA is where I was Oh, I see. About. No, yeah. no, no. Right. Yeah. Hi. So I have this uh, use case that used to work with NFS. So I have NFS data store and we used to have the VMware VM files on the folder, the VMX, the VMDKs and everything. If I copy over that folder of the VM and register the VMX, the VM is up and running and it's pretty much okay. Is the similar thing supported with the VWall where we will be having config folder different VWall, then we have the data VWall that will be having the VMDK. So if I copy over using the data database, sorry, the data store browser, the VM that is hosted on the VWall, can I use the VMX and register it and start it and it will be powered on? Will there be any impact on the data volume? Well, there's the actually VM a clone case? operation through VASA, so you can actually ask VASA to clone this VM. Right. And in that case, you should be able to start both VMs. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, uh, in terms of going in through the VMFS, you know, actually doing it on your ESX box, I'm not sure. So this uh, will be specific to WASA broader, right? If I yeah. uh, copy over using the database browser. We're running perilously short on time. So let's, let's, let's uh, yes, the, take the last couple of questions here. Actually, okay. yeah. off, off. I can quickly answer that one. It won't work. Okay. The, the data that's in your virtual disk is in VVOLs that are separate. They don't exist inside the folder that you're looking at. And besides, the descriptor files you'd be copying would be referring to the old VVOL. So okay. nothing like that. But the good news is, as he said, Clone is fully offloaded, so when you yep. clone a VM in, in vSphere, it'll happen super efficiently because there's no actual copying done except okay. by the UA itself. Right? Okay. I can okay. try using the snapshot uh, of VWAL with the can, API. You can right? talk to me afterwards. I'll be yeah. around. Yeah, that's yes. right. okay. I just wanted to wrap, okay. make sure that we wrapped up. We'll take the last couple of questions after the session is over. Yep. But fundamentally, I just want to say, you know, this is a new way of delivering storage. It is absolutely a, a shift in terms of the mentality of the way we've done things historically. We gain all sorts of benefits from this model by moving it towards this policy-driven approach, by putting the virtual machine in charge of requesting uh, services rather than the infrastructure in charge of delivering services that we hope line up with those uh, services that we pre-provisioned. Now, it does require a change in mentality because we are so entrenched in that model of delivering infrastructure and then lining up the resources afterwards so if you take one thing away that from, from the, the VVOL approach, I would say that it's got to be this storage policy-based management is the entryway into virtual volumes. Aside from that, we gain all sorts of benefits, but our users have to understand that things are different in this model, that the applications and the policies are dictating what is going to happen at the storage level, and that the storage is now intelligent enough to respond to those changes. So really make sure that you understand the storage policy aspect of this, because this is where everything flows from. And then the VVOLs now provide this intelligent and dynamic way of providing data services back to the vSphere cluster. So with that, I'll thank you very much. I appreciate everyone coming on the last day.